Uh, here are my disclosures. Uh, so when we're talking about hitting the target, we need to know what the targets are. And in the red shade, what is this point? Yes. Excellent. In the red shade, are, this is cutaneous melanoma from the um, TCGA published in 2015. In red are BRAF mutations, in green are NRAF mutations, in blue are uh, loss of function NF1 mutations, and then the rest are the so-called triple wild type. I'm going to focus uh, it sort of exclusively on BRAF for the purposes of this uh, talk, um, mainly because that's where we only, that's only where we've seen um, substantial benefit in targeted therapy in melanoma to date. Uh, the targets, though, um, in red are, are these mutated um, oncogenes. Uh, here's BRAF. This is MEK. This is ERK. Uh, there's data with all three of those inhibitors, RAF, MEK, and ERK, in BRAF mutant melanoma. Um, and again, I'm going to focus mostly on, on the, the agents that have uh, received FDA approval and then expanding upon some of that data. So this is the advanced melanoma treatment landscape in 2020. Um, in red are BRAF-targeted therapies that have been approved over the past decade, initially single-agent vemurafenib, dibrafenib, the MEK inhibitor trametinib. Uh, then the combinations began to get approved with dibrafenib and trametinib, then vemcobi uh, and oncobini. In, in the sort of darker blue or black is the, uh, the uh, immunotherapies that have also been approved. Um, so this is where we are. Uh, and so let's get into some of the data. So single-agent BRAF-targeted therapy uh, was shown across uh, a couple of studies, large phase three trials that led to the approval of dibrafenib and vemurafenib uh, to be superior to chemotherapy. These are the uh, Kaplan-Meier progression-free survival curves. These are the waterfall plots uh, for single-agent BRAF-targeted therapy. The conclusion is most patients benefit, uh, but that benefit tends to be relatively temporary. Moving on uh, were then four uh, randomized phase three trials of three combinations, dibrafenib, trametinib, vemurafenib, cobimetinib, oncorafenib, binimetinib, each demonstrating an improvement in progression-free and overall survival uh, compared to single-agent BRAF-targeted therapy plus placebo, uh, and the placebos uh, were in combi D, dibrafenib, and combi V, vemurafenib, and cobrim, vemurafenib, uh, and the Columbus study. Um, that would be um, vemurafenib. So um, this set of data led to the change in standard of care that if you were going to prescribe uh, a BRAF targeted therapy, you would prescribe a combination of a BRAF inhibitor and a MEK inhibitor. So that's three distinct regimens. Oh, actually, I'm going to go back one second. Uh, the PFS is about 14.9 months, just in case you're keeping score in terms of answering <laughs> questions later. Um, so how do we choose amongst these regimens? So I think there are a few different considerations. There's chemical and practical considerations. There's comparative toxicity, comparative efficacy. Uh, so let's take a look at that. So there are differences in the pharmacokinetics of these agents and these combinations. So uh, dibrafenib, oncorafenib, and binimetinib all have relatively short half-lives. Trametinib, vemurafenib, and cobimetinib all have relatively long half-lives. The only regimen that has two relatively short half-lives agents is the oncorafenib and binimetinib one. What does that mean? It probably means that the toxicities get better quicker um, if you're on oncorafenib and binimetinib. Uh, it means that if you have a lingering toxicity, it's going to linger longer uh, if you're having, a, say, a MEK inhibitor toxicity from those other two regimens. Uh, but probably most importantly, it, it has more implications when developing triplet and quadruplet um, combination trials than it, or combination um, regimens than it does probably anything else. So I think it's relevant to mention. Uh, it, has, it definitely has clinical relevance because it, it can help us kind of understand how quickly somebody's going to recover from their toxicity. Um, but uh, it's probably most important from an academic standpoint at this point. How about differences in delivery? Uh, again, pay attention because there's going to be a question on this later, and I want to look like we've really educated you guys. Um, dibrafenib and trametinib, uh, vemcobi, oncobini, what's different about them just in terms of delivery? Uh, dibrafenib and trametinib is five pills a day. Um, you take it two hours uh, after or one hour before food. So this, that the latter part is the most um, 
kind of impactful part. You really have to think about what you're doing that day. Uh, you really have to kind of structure taking your medications around when you're going to eat. Vemurafenib cobimetinib uh, is significantly more tablets uh, a day, um, 11 pills per day. Uh, and um, the cobimetinib is actually taken uh, three weeks on, one week off. So, so there's a sort of peculiar way of, of delivering that regimen. Uh, with that said, um, it can be taken with or without a meal. That's an advantage. Uh, and there's now flexibility. The challenge with dibrafenib, if you want to reduce the MEK inhibitor dose, you actually have to prescribe uh, 0.5 milligram tablets. So it becomes kind of a little bit of a, of a hassle. Um, whereas with this regimen, if you can, you can dose reduce both the BRAF and the MEK inhibitor at the same time. Oncorafenib and binimetinib is coming in at the most tablets, uh, 12 per day. Um, it's taken with food, and again, you have the, the flexibility regarding dose reduction. So what's best for a patient, you sort of can discuss with the patient and, and figure out what matters to them. If it's the least amount of pills, it's dibrafenib, trametinib. If it's the most flexibility with respect to eating, it's probably vemurafenib and cobimetinib, uh, and so on. How about the differences in development? So the uh, recommended uh, phase two and then the FDA approved doses based off the phase three trials are actually the maximum tolerated dose of dibrafenib and trametinib. That was the regimen, so we were able to get the same exposure as single agent as combination. Same with bemorafenib and cobimetinib. Different for oncorafenib and binimetinib. The single agent uh, dose for, for oncorafenib is 300 milligrams a day. The combination dose is 450 milligrams a day. Why is that? So it turns out that when you inhibit mutated BRAF, the side effects are actually related to activating the pathway in non-mutated cells. It's so-called paradoxical activation of the pathway. MEK inhibitors, when they cause toxicity, reduce pathway activation, both in the malignant mutated as well as uh, the non-malignant cells. And so you can actually get away with a higher dose. When these drugs were being developed, um, Oncorafen and Binimetinib was a little bit later, and so we knew that this was a thing, and so we, we were able to kind of convince the company that was developing this to push the dose higher and see if we could get away with a higher level of, of exposure. So it was just a quirk of which regimen happened when. Um, but it happens with all the BRAF inhibitors, but this was the only regimen where, where it was pushed to the max. How about comparative toxicity? The way I would state it is all of these uh, regimens are relatively well tolerated. The combined toxicity is similar to single agent toxicity of BRAF inhibitors with a few caveats. Um, Combi D and Combi V, which is the DAB TRAM studies, uh, really highlighted this high rate of pyrexia. It's higher than single agent therapy. Uh, it's the bane of the existence of our nurses uh, and our nurse practitioners in our practice uh, who are dealing with lots and lots of fevers all the time. There are ways of mitigating that. Um, but um, it is a p it potential issue uh, in terms of a dose-limiting issue. In terms of oncorafenib and binimetinib, there's a lot of uh, toxicities that, that seem um, to highlight, but, but really uh, probably the most important are um, arthralgias at ALT, AST elevation, uh, and with um, vemorafenib and vemorafenib cobimetinib, it's photosensitivity. And if you think about the dominant toxicities, this is probably the best way of comparing across for our patients to say, if you're on DABTRAM, fever is what you're going to have to deal with. We're going to deal with all the other things we have to deal with with MEK inhibitors. They can cause a cardiomyopathy. They can cause eye problems. Uh, they can cause swelling. But really, the, the thing that we worry the most about and, and, and um, talk to our patients about is fever. Um, with oncorafenib and binimetinib, um, nausea uh, and liver function abnormalities are something we pay close attention to. And then with um, them and COBE, it's photosensitivity. Here's comparative toxicity across regimens, and, and I think the, the summary is um, DABTRAM, way more fever than VEMCOBI or, or Oncobini, photosensitivity way, way more with VEMCOBI than with DABTRAM or Oncobini, AST, ALT elevation, Oncobini more than VEMCOBI, which is a lot more than DABTRAM, and nausea seems to be a bit more with VEMCOBI. How about comparative efficacy? So, we obviously don't have head-to-head-to-head -to -head -to -head data. Uh, what we can say is that the response rate of the, the triplet regimens are all about the same. The progression-free survival uh, difference uh, is about the same with hazard ratios in the mid to high 0.5s. 
um, overall survival um, comparators uh, suggest that um, these are all about the same. So I, I can't stand here and say one is more efficacious than the other. Um, and so we typically don't make decisions based on, on one drug combination is more efficacious than the other. We basically say they have a different spectrum of how you take them uh, in, in the, um, the toxicity portfolio or profile. So summary, single agent BRAF and MEK are better than chemotherapy. That's old news. Combination BRAF MEK inhibitor therapy uh, is associated with improved outcomes compared to BRAF single agent targeted therapy, also old news. Um, we now have three BRAF MEK inhibitor regimens demonstrating improved outcomes, also old news. Uh, and they're all reasonably well tolerated. They're all very effective, but they have different properties. Um, again, the, the PK may influence how we develop future regimens, but they're probably not going to have any great relevance to whether we pick one drug regimen over the other. Um, and the dominant toxicities may help in patient selection. So that's the old news. What about the long-term data with these agents? So this is relatively new news. So we now have five-year data on the, on the dibrafenib-trimetinib combination phase three trials uh, and the vemurafenib covimetinib phase three trials. And this is what it looks like. This is progression-free survival. Uh, and about 25% of patients are progression-free at three years, and, and depending on the regimen, 14 to 19% of patients are progression-free at five years. That's not an insignificant statement to say that, that targeted therapy, which all of us who were doing these trials assumed would, would not be associated with even a 5% long-term progression-free survival, uh, that, that, that there are, is a subset of patients that maintain um, long-term benefit with these agents. Um, interestingly, a greater percentage of patients with a normal LDH uh, are progression-free at five years. Uh, and that goes up from 7% to 18% uh, with uh, or with uh, vemurafenib coimetinib. It goes up from 8% to 25% with dibrafenib trimetinib. So interestingly, just selecting on a biochemical um, test before patients start, you can, you can increase the, the chances that that patient's going to be progression-free at five years. And then furthermore, uh, if you look at the number of disease sites, less than three in a normal LDH, uh, you end up getting about a third of patients who are progression-free at five years. We don't have the comparative data with, with immunotherapy to say what's the rate of, of those patients being progression-free um, if, you, if you pick that, that population of patients, although I'll show some of the, the, that, that data in a second. Here's the overall survival, 34% um, long-term survival with dibrafenib and trametinib. Uh, that number uh, is, is similar with vemurafenib and cobimetinib. Uh, and again, if you stratify by LDH, or if you stratify by LDH and number of disease sites, you get to, uh, at least with the dibrafenib trimetinib data, uh, over 50% of patients are alive at five years. So how does this compare with immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy? Uh, well, here's the five-year data uh, from the Checkmate 067. This is progression-free survival, 29% with single-agent nivolumab, 36% with combination uh, ipilimumab and nivolumab, 44% uh, overall survival at five years with nivolumab, and 52% uh, with um, ipinevo. If you can't remember stuff from one slide to the next, I've summarized it in this table. Um, and so the response rate's higher with BRAF-targeted therapy, although not a whole lot higher than it combined immune checkpoint inhibitor therapy. And, the, and just numerically, comparing across trials, if there's any statisticians in the room, I didn't see that on the, on the list of potential occupations that people have here, but if they're statisticians, they might vomit if I'm cross-comparing. Um, but it looks like the immunotherapy is a bit better uh, from a frontline uh, standpoint. So how do we use MAP? kinase targeted therapy, how do we use BRAF MEK combination in this era of immunotherapy? And the way that I think about it is most patients, it's not an either or choice. It's a first this, then that choice. Most of our patients will receive immunotherapy first and then BRAF mutant patients, of course, and then they'll receive BRAF targeted therapy. Some patients will start with BRAF targeted therapy and then get immunotherapy. And that's you know, if, if a patient is, is, has a 50% survival at five years of ipinevo and they're BRAF mutated, there's still a 50% chance that patient's going to still need another agent. Uh, and so practically it's more what do we use when as opposed to um, do we just choose one or the other. 
However, there's another choice, and it's we, maybe there's, we can combine these drugs together uh, and, and get to perhaps a better place. Uh, there's rationale for this. Turns out BRF targeted therapy increases antigen expression in, in melanoma. It decreases immunotherapy, or sorry, uh, immunosuppressive cytokine production. It increases CD8 positive T cells. Uh, it increases T cell clonality, and it increases PDL1 expression. And so all of these things, if you were to try and say, what do I need to do to make a tumor more susceptible to PD-1 or PDL1 inhibition, all five of these things would be a good thing. It would seem to suggest that those tumors may be more likely to benefit. So the question is, does BRF targeted therapy set up the tumor to be more responsive? There's preclinical data to suggest it does. So these are uh, work uh, led by Jen Wargo. Uh, and Tony Rebus suggesting that combined BRF targeted therapy is better uh, than single agent therapies of the individual single agents. Of course, that's mice. What about people? So this is a trial that Dr. Hamid uh, and I uh, worked on. Uh, we started with bemorafenib and atezolizumab because at the time, single agent BRF targeted therapy was the targeted therapy that we used. And it turned out that when we combined VEM and COBE, I'm sorry, VEM and uh, Atezo, uh, it was very toxic. And so we had to modify the, the dose so that we led in with Vemorafenib and then we could start Atezolizumab. Uh, and the data looked pretty good. There's a lot of complete responses, a lot of patients who had 100% reduction in tumor volume. Uh, and then the field changed. And as I showed you, BREF met combo became what we do. Uh, and so we just adopted the VEM COBE regimen and then added Atezolizumab. Uh, complete response rate over 70 percent, 71.8 if you're keeping score and taking questions later. And um, most importantly, these seem to be pretty profound responses, uh, even in the non-complete responders, and fairly durable responses. And I point this patient out, who was my patient, who at, at, after the 28-day lead-in of Vemcobi was progressing, uh, we then um, started the atezolizumab, and he began uh, to start responding, and he's still on therapy five years later, six years later. So it's, you know, pretty amazing regimen that this has turned out to be. Um, it has effects um, on, on the immune populations. This is looking at um, T cells in the tumor, um, and so the lead-in leads to increased numbers of CD4 positive cells and CD8 positive cells. Um, the VEM itself actually led to an increase in T regulatory cells in the tumor microenvironment, whereas uh, the uh, VEMCOBE led to slightly reduced, uh, and then it went up uh, in the setting of atezolizumab. Um, in terms of safety, uh, significant grade 3, 4 toxicity. The majority of patients had grade 3, 4 toxicity, uh, but it was manageable and we could get patients through it. Um, and so our summary was we can give patients triplet therapy. There's an interesting efficacy signal. Safety is an issue, but we can get patients through the toxicity. There's interesting things happening in the tumor microenvironment, and this data led to a phase three trial being launched. And in fact, uh, within the last um, month and a half, there was a, a press release, actually two months ago, uh, December 13th, stating that this phase three trial was positive. It met its primary endpoint. There was no data in the press release, and we'll look forward to data uh, later this year. Uh, there are other regimens as well. This is dibrafenib, trametinib, and spartalizumab. Uh, the early data suggest a very high complete response rate. This is the phase one, two data, uh, 40 percent or more complete response rate. Uh, that's pretty exciting. Uh, but again, very high toxicity rate, so greater than 50 percent of patients. And this, uh, it was about 65 or 66 percent of patients had, had high-grade toxicity from the triplet regimen. So now what are we going to do? Are we there yet? Do, you know, we haven't seen the, 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 re, the randomized phase three trial data. There is randomized data from a phase two study of dibrafenib, trametinib, and pembrolizumab. And the, the summary is high toxicity. But with time, it looks like progression-free survival is a little bit better. Overall survival was stone-cold negative at the first data cut seems to be separating a little bit now. And the way that I'd summarize it is uh, the triplet regimen is safe but has toxicity. There's an interestingly a lower response rate with, doublet, or with triplet versus doublet, probably because of toxicity. 
uh, but there's a similar improved uh, complete response rate to the other regimens. There's improved progression-free survival, a seemingly improved duration of response, and no significance in overall survival yet, but it does appear that these curves are separating. This is the overall survival curve. So I would actually argue that MAP kinase therapy is immunotherapy. Um, we're seeing changes in the tumor microenvironment. Um, we're seeing promising um, data in the phase one and two studies of triplet therapy, and we now have randomized phase three trials that have been completed accrual, and we anticipate to actually see the data uh, in the next few months. Uh, with that, I thank you for your attention, and I'll look forward to the discussion later.